House Speaker Mike Johnson has reportedly left a door open to a new Ukraine aid proposal in the House while shooting down the Senate's bipartisan aid package for Ukraine. Now, Johnson has allegedly met privately with House Republicans who've been working to build support for a new foreign aid package, per CNN. This comes as Florida Senator Marco Rubio gave his prediction on how the Ukraine-Russia war could end. Here's what he said on Fox News on Sunday. There is no way that the Russian Federation takes Ukraine, all of Ukraine, half of Ukraine. And that was, that was Putin's goal from the beginning, was to carve it up in, into half, at least half the country, including Kyiv. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. On the other side of it, we have the reality of it is that Ukraine is small compared to Russia in terms of size and its ability to bring scale, its ability to force conscript people. So neither neither kind. This is I'm just being honest. And, I've, and you know, in the past, I have tried not to talk about this publicly because I thought it undermined uh, the, the leverage that Ukraine had. But now it's the reality. Neither side is going to be able to achieve victory as defined in the most idealistic terms. Hmm. All right. To that clip set off a lot of alarm bells on social media this weekend from folks who have been, regardless of what it meant for leverage, been willing to say openly that there was likely to be this exact kind of a stalemate given the asymmetry between the military force of Russia and Ukraine. And that it is perhaps unethical, this is the argument that many people on the left, people like Aaron Maté and Max Blumenthal were making, that it is unethical to mislead the American public, the Ukrainian public, into believing that it could win the war with just enough American aid when the U.S. interest is to weaken Putin, regardless of whether or not it puts Ukraine in a better bargaining position in the longer term. But it sounds like he's saying that he thought having a positive attitude was helpful, mm. and so he was doing that. Yeah, yeah, I looked, you know, from the start. So, so Rubio is a bit of a chameleon. Um, when he was first coming to national prominence, I would have said that he was very much a neoconservative member of the Republican side of things. Obviously, he ran against Donald Trump. He was extremely critical of Donald Trump. Um, he was, you know, while, while having differences from, from a George W. Bush kind of some differences, he was very much a continuation of that foreign policy. Now, he's also a somewhat savvy political operator and realizes that that is not the future of the party. And I would say he has at least rhetorically backed off a lot of those commitments. Now, when, when Russia first invaded Ukraine um, a couple years ago, he, like honestly, like most other political figures in both parties, condemned it very strongly and urged us to take um, some action. Now, he was kind of vague about what should be done. It's kind of like, we should do something. We can't just let, you know, Putin get away with this, that kind of stuff. Um, he was also, when the conflict first began, he started, like, live tweeting a lot of um, almost details of the skirmishes on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, he said that Putin it was experiencing a, Putin was having a mental decline, health mm -hmm. decline, is something he claimed. So... Anyway, I think he he now, now I think he knows you know where his own base yeah. is at with respect to Ukraine, I mean, which is to not support yeah. giving. The, the controversy here is that to say then what he's saying now got so many people labeled as Putin puppet. To say anything realistic about the military capacity of these two respective countries and how this was likely to end was to be told you were giving comfort and aid to Putin and that you secretly wanted him to defeat Ukraine and that you thought the invasion was justified and all of those kinds yeah. of things. So this does feel a little rich and the timing of this feels suspicious, especially in light of the fact that it does seem like to the extent that there might have been a moment where we thought where the, the public thought that MAGA might not uh, retain its strength. Folks were opining a year ago that um, Ron DeSantis was looking strong and Trump was looking weak, and they were these evaluations of their uh, campaign launch events that were very critical of Donald Trump. And perhaps there was some belief that the, um, the, the kind of polarizing nature of Ukraine would diminish over time. That has not happened. And it does seem like people are now getting back into the Freedom Caucus orientation that says, especially given the, the way the war has gone, uh, that says we've got to do America first and we've got to um, ratchet back aid. Now, the Mike uh, Johnson of it all is really interesting. Yeah, uh, one more thing I want to say about Rubio, though, before we get to that, sure. because you brought up DeSantis. So Rubio and a couple other people did criticize DeSantis a year ago for calling um, the Ukraine conflict a territorial dispute. Mm -hmm. Rubio and some others were pretty harsh on him for that. It sounds like he's that's what He's I'm ended saying. up much closer to the DeSantis yes. point of view, which and DeSantis himself, you know, has said, uh, so, uh, I think also came from a neocon exactly. position and has pivoted, I think, probably 
quicker and maybe with more sincerity than Marco Rubio. Yeah, that's well, a low bar to clear. The, so there's, there is this definite kind of MAGA realignment, which is why it's so interesting to see what Mike Johnson does, because Mike Johnson is only there because of Kevin McCarthy's failure to sufficiently realign himself with this Freedom Caucus, more MAGA-oriented MAGA aspect uh, of the, the Republican base. And in fact, is out precisely because there was this concern that he was too conciliatory on these foreign aid packages. So what is Mike Johnson going to do now? Now, he seems to be expressing some openness to the idea of passing aid to Ukraine at the same time that there is this bifurcation that's happening where some Republicans, uh, the, Ukraine has become the Republicans' bet noir. Israel has become the Democrats' issue. There's this effort to make a joint package to make everybody equally happy or unhappy. Equally unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> right. But the question is, if Mike Johnson concedes to that, is he going to find himself in the same position as Kevin McCarthy, or are Republicans going to realize that ultimately concessions are going to have to be made. The establishment of both parties is very supportive of both aid packages. And that unless they're just going to keep playing replace the speaker every six months or so, there's going to have to be some uh, acknowledgement, some realization that they're going to have to eat some crow here. Yeah, I, I do not think it is wise on any level to, um, to have a new Ukraine funding package for a Republican leader. I think... Um, Mike Johnson's head will be on a spike right next to Kevin McCarthy's if he allows yeah. that to happen. This has become a major issue for the base. Look, the the establishment on the Republican side, the establishment is taking some L's. Mitch yeah. McConnell is going to be out by the end of the year. Um, a, a, the attempts to have a real, realignment on the Republican side, I'm not saying it's it's like notching policy wins, but people. People are losing. People are losing their power on the Republican side for clinging to things that are unpopular. Um, so I, I think, frankly, Mike Johnson so far seems to be a smarter political operative than that, than Kevin McCarthy. So holding out and not doing that would be, would be the wisest course of action because the Republican base clearly does not want more funding for Ukraine. Yes. Even the ones who were previously supportive of it yeah. have changed their mind about it because it's not... The idea that it's going to result in Ukraine winning the war or some, you know, that it's going to result in anything but wasted money, wasted weapons and more people dead is, I think, a fantasy that no one believes anymore. What do you make of the asymmetry between how the Republican base and the Freedom Caucus folks who seem to represent them on this issue are approaching Ukraine aid versus Israel aid? Well, I mean, of course, some people, it's a much smaller number of people, but there are people on the Republican side who are equally skeptical of Israel aid, your Thomas Massey's, um, your Rand Paul's to a degree, um, and others. Um, and others. I mean, I, I take your point, Re Massey and Paul, yeah. but that is a very small co cohort of more libertarian-minded Republicans in a, an arena where it does seem like the divide is more about kind of the perception that Ukraine is Biden's war, being anti-Ukraine be, is, is a way to uh, position yourself against Democrats, where Israel doesn't have that same valence. There have been so many Republicans, as there are so many Democrats, so many establishment figures across the board who have remained stalwart in their commitment to Israel. Yeah, look, I think they could make themselves more popular with their voters if they um, signaled opposition. Again, they don't have to say anything negative about Israel itself, but signal skepticism of continuing to just send money overseas, including to the state of Israel, would be something that would they would find they were more popular with their voters, with their Republican voters, who don't want to give handouts to other nations, period. When we're in debt and we have all these problems, it, it doesn't make any sense to Republican voters. Um, I mean, there are conservatives, people like Candace Owens and other, Tucker Carlson, who express a lot of skepticism on this point and have massive audiences and more Republican members of Congress. Again, they don't have to betray Israel or say anything bad about Israel or go, you know, they don't have to yeah. join you and in, in, in your, uh, your movement, but they would find out that being against giving funding to other countries would be more popular than they. Yeah, the movement, to be clear, it's not just about funding. The question is whether or not we should be, the United States should be using its power on the UN, for instance, to veto uh, ceasefire bills right, and prevent I mean. uh, international law from doing its job and treating Israel the same way it's treated any other country who has been plausibly accused of a genocide. But yeah, it'll be really interesting to see how Republicans sort out the differences uh, among its base and how they feel about those different, uh, those two issues there. Mm -hmm. Stick around, we have more Rising for you coming up next.